to us is viewed to have a responsibility. It's an expensive responsibility. But the U.S. is called upon to help. I know that uh, in some of this help ends up being a war. And there's loss of lives. But what I'm saying is, if you put that in the context of, you know, I mean, we don't go into war because we want it. We're called into it. Uh, there, uh, it's, it's expensive to get involved in. The, it, the population is split between this issue. But what I'm saying is when you have a, an area that, does, that doesn't get any help from its own government, I think the international community has a responsibility or is viewed upon as having a responsibility to help. And the U.S. has picked up the tab in a lot of these a lot of the, uh, these efforts. So I guess I would like to find out what your yeah. what your response. The U.S. and other countries, for that matter. Actually, when I talk about the obsolescence of war, I'm really saying that uh, you know, if you if you you have already correctly a fairly good understanding of what is going on, um, then you know that the the kinds of uh, expenditures that we expend for this total war against these insurgents. Um, uh, may not be the, the way to do it because while indeed you are doing police work and this police work had to be done by the police by the way not by the military because the military is a very expensive organization to support so as i keep on saying the military is not mandated to do these things to run after criminals so on one hand you're looking at the law enforcement and on the other hand you're doing economic uh, development activities it's not that you know, you establish order first and that is the time. You know, you do the military operation first and then you do the economic. We've been doing this for what, a good part of 60 years and nothing is happening. So, why are we doing it wrong? I think what we're doing wrong is that the military is at the forefront of our policy in regard to all these insurgencies. Yeah, I have a question. In 1950, the country in Asia that had the highest standard of living and that was the wealthiest nation was the Philippines. In 1950, the country of Asia that had the lowest standard of living and the poorest country in all of Asia was South Korea. And now today, it seems the two roles have completely reversed. Could you tell us what happened and whose fault that is? Yeah. Whose fault would be two. Uh, always we talk about the structures and we talk about the people. Um, if you compare where the Philippines was, you are correct, second only to Japan, first in most everything, and yet now at the bottom of every list. The only list where we are at the top would be the list of countries hit by disaster. That's where we top the list, so it's not even a good list to be at the top. So many, many reasons, actually. Uh, so institutional would be many of the structures have been so designed that the grid labs cannot be uh, removed. That's why uh, cannot suddenly disappear, however well-intentioned people are. Uh, and so if we're hoping, for example, that the Messiah, like uh, the son of uh, the Aquinos, Noinoi Aquino, is going to come and save us all, then uh, really we've got another thing coming. There are others. The massive corruption, you know, is, um, is almost institutionalized. Uh, what I discovered uh, when I got into government work at the National Defense is that to be able to know uh, how to steal one peso from the Philippine government, you need seven people to be in collusion. I being the seventh, being the one who is signing the, the, the check. Which means you cannot steal one peso if there are no people in collusion within. Now, if you are not an insider also, you will not know how corruption happens because the paper trail alone will not tell you. The paper trail will tell you that the bullet is, uh, is $2. Actually, it is $1, you know? So you broadcast your money to the rest of the people who will get the increment between you know, the actual cost and the like. So it's something so deeply seated and uh, it's not something which any one person called the President of the Republic in May, in June 2010 can do something about. There's a massive restructuring that we need to do. So yes, the answer, the quick answer is both institutional as well as... Uh, so why was South Korea successful? Many reasons also. State intervention is one of them. It would seem like, uh, you know, the state is part of the economic activities of, of that country. 
While it is true that the chabols had been denigrated many, many times, in fact, it became the engine of their growth. Okay, we have time for one more question over here. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, um, soon after the Vietnam War, our president had recognized probably the same things that we're, that we're discussing here. And out of that came out this organization, which many of us probably have heard of, including yourself, it's the Peace Corps. Could you speak to that as far as how you, maybe if you've studied it, how effective it has been, or is this something, an, an area that maybe even the Philippines may or, or has considered? I think that one is being duplicated in other forms where you now have uh, student exchanges. I think that's uh, well and good because people are, uh, it's an avenue for people to understand each other. You know? Said the versus is the us and the that is really the, the divide uh, really uh, makes it very, very difficult to even come out with you know, ways to, to improve the quality of life. Uh, one of the things that we little uh, noticed, and uh, I paid attention to that because uh, one book I had written is on bureaucratic reform, is no matter how, uh, how good a policy you have, uh, uh, how uh, crafted it, uh, it is, the bureaucracy can compromise that and can effectively sidetrack whatever normal intentions you have. And the bureaucracy is so entrenched. We're talking of 1.5 million people who are used to doing things according a certain SOP. And that is inertia at rest. And you know that inertia at rest will take considerable amount of force to change. So that one again, the new president will have to pay attention to. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. I just want to make a correction about the, 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 the forum in the UP Alumni Association. It's going to be on Saturday. Uh, instead of tomorrow. Saturday, 11 o'clock at the Merlo Cafe at the Ramada Hotel, the former Imperial Suites uh, uh, along Ipau Road. Uh, lunch is um, $11 and it's only to cover the cost of the lunch. So I hope many of you will be able to come to that forum. Uh, at this point, um, when I ask Senator Jim Aspaldon to come to the stage, I believe he has uh, a resolution to offer to Dr. Carlos. Dr. Carlos, I'm glad you're up here, so I don't have to call you that. But I tell you, this is definitely has this discuss, discussion has definitely been thought provoking. Uh, just you can tell just by the questions alone and some of the comments that have been made. And so I have to say that this is definitely enjoyable because that's exactly what the university is supposed to be about to be able to expand our minds by hearing other people and what they have to say, exchanging the ideas that we have with one another. Because who knows, maybe Dr. Carlos goes back to the Philippines and says she's enlightened by some of the questions and the comments that were made here today. But in like kind, we have to admit also that she has expanded our mind. And because of that, and because you have come uh, here to uh, share your understanding and your knowledge and your intelligence with us, uh, on behalf of everybody here and the whole university community, and in essence, basically all of Guam, I want to give basically the presentation, uh, present this resolution to you. This is relative to recommending, uh, excuse me, welcoming and commending and thanking you for uh, coming on this occasion uh, to be the inaugural lecturer at the University of Guam Philippine Studies Lecture Series. And so, with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Carlos. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator Espaldon, and we thank Dr. Carlos again for her uh, presentation tonight, the inaugural lecture of the Philippine uh, Studies uh, Lecture Series at the University of Guam. We hope that this is not going to be the last, the first of many more to come. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and if you have any more questions, please come to the forum at 11 o'clock on Saturday at the Marlowe Temple.